Hello, uh, I'm Carl Harico, and uh, I was one of the former presidents of the United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey, UACNJ, and uh, am now president of the New Jersey chapter of the National Space Society called the uh, Space and Astronomy Society of Northwest Jersey. And I'd like to give this presentation. It's called Women in Science. And in this presentation, I'll be giving information about various women that are in various areas in science. Looking at these images here, you may or may not recognize some of the women. Looking at this image, uh, some more women are shown here. Upper right, for example, might be someone that you do recognize. This woman uh, was the one who discovered two new elements, which he named polonium and radium. I wonder who that could be. Lower left is a movie star, Hedy Lamarr. What is she doing here with women in science? Well, we're going to find out by going through this PowerPoint presentation. Now, who is this? Wondering about this? Look familiar? Well, she was the one in the upper right part of that image. And uh, she was the one, you can see, born here between the ages, uh, the uh, uh, years uh, of 1800 to 1900. She was the one that came up with finding uh, polonium and radium. Let's start way back at the time of the ancient Greeks, uh, beginning with the year 370, the year of birth of Hypatia of Alexandria. She was a polymath. A polymath is a person who is well-versed in areas of mathematics and uh, different areas in science. She lectured on not only mathematics, but she also lectured on astronomy and Philosophy, Hypatia, or Hypatia. Here's some images showing her uh, giving lectures in different kinds of situations. On the far left, you see her probably giving a lecture in the area of philosophy. In the middle, you can see her using some kind of an instrument, measuring information about the stars, their angles, angular difference from each other, and that instrument is probably a uh, Ptolemic ruler. So maybe Ptolemy was the person who developed it. And on the far right, you can imagine her giving some kind of lecture in the area of mathematics. Next, we have Hildegard of Bingen, a nun who became a saint. She was an astronomer as well. And we're talking about the year what? 1098 to 1179. Wow, that's quite some time ago. And uh, she also was a polymath. And what, what is interesting is that she came up with the idea that our solar system is a heliocentric or a sun-centered system well before Copernicus, who came up with it in the 1500s. She also came up with the idea that the planets are held in orbit around the sun by gravity. So the notion of universal gravitation before Sir Isaac Newton came up with it in the 1600s. And you can see in the image at the bottom, she's shown in diagrammatic form. Next to her is an image of the solar system as uh, depicted by uh, or thought of by Copernicus with the planets going around the sun. We now have uh, Caroline Herschel, the sister of William Herschel, who was the astronomer who discovered the planet Uranus. Now we're into the year 17 to 1800 at this point. As his sister, she assisted him in whatever he did and also found out a few things on her own. These are 
uh, various paintings and drawings of her because the camera was not invented and the first photo was taken in about 1865, uh, some, some time around then. So these are all uh, paintings and ideas that uh, were derived by various kinds of uh, artists. Left is a painting of her, of course, in the middle. Upper would be her working with her brother, William Herschel. On the far right would be images of Uranus, as discovered by William Herschel. Lower left would be her working with her own telescope, finding, as you see in the middle, uh, depicted a discovery of around eight different comets. On the far right, you can see her. She discovered an elliptical galaxy, which has now been designated as M or Messier 110, next to the Andromeda galaxy. Caroline Herschel. Next is Ada Augusta King, and the year is the 1800s. She was the daughter of Lord Byron, who was the poet and politician at that time. She uh, is known to be uh, one that introduced computer science and the idea of coming up with with various kinds of computer concepts. So she could be called the computer programmer, the first one before computers were invented. Here she is also known as the Countess of Lovelace, the first computer programmer. You can see behind her various kinds of uh, computations on the blackboard. Next is Maria Mitchell, and the year is uh, 1800s again. And Maria Mitchell, at age 17, uh, came up with uh, uh, st establishing a school for women in math and science. She was also the first professional astronomer, and she discovered a comet that's named after her. So she did quite a bit in the area of astronomy. Maria Mitchell. Here she is, depicted left in a drawing, looking at the comet that was named after her. Florence Nightingale, and the year would be the 18 to 1900s in that range. Uh, she uh, was the head British nurse during the Crimean War. She later became the general superintendent of military hospitals in England. So she could be called the founder of modern day nursing. Florence Nightingale. These are called Pickering Computers, this group of women. Pickering is at the bottom there, Edward Pickering. Uh, he selected women to work on various kinds of data that was derived and gotten by various kinds of astronomers. And uh, they collated the data, they organized it, uh, categorized, classified, did all that work that he said they could do better than men could. So he called them his women computers. Now, from this, this group of women computers came Annie Jump Cannon, and the year is 18 to 1900. She came up with a modern-day classification of stars. Before her, the stars were classified in terms of how much hydrogen they had. And as a result, they were classified from A to Q. What she did is she looked at star spectrum, and from that, she reorganized it into the classification that was based on the idea of their temperature. 
And when she reorganized it, it was reorganized in the fashion of O B A F G K M. You could say it in terms of an acronym, O B a fine girl or guy kiss me. And that would be O B A F G K M. So she used star spectrum then to come up with this classification. And again, it was based on temperature. She used the absorption lines in a spectrum of a star. When a star, or any kind of light, gives, gives off that light in a form of photons, if you have it pass through a prism or a diffraction grating, as you see here in the lower diagram, it produces a spectrum from red to violet. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet, Roy G. Biv. And in that spectrum, if it's coming from a star, it also includes dark spectral lines. These dark lines are caused by the photons of light coming out of that star from a hot region through a cooler region of gas in the outer portion of the star. And that cooler region of gas absorbs certain photons. And those black lines in that spectrum uh, show where those photons were absorbed by the outer portion of the star. So the dark lines are called absorption or dark lines in the star. Now, these dark lines uh, form a pattern for each individual element. So each element produces a different pattern, an arrangement of these dark lines. And so they act as a fingerprint for each individual element. So once you get the spectrum from the star, you can determine what elements make up the star by looking at that fingerprint. Now, those dark lines also give other information. If the line is very strong, shows up very strongly, it indicates the temperature of the star. The higher the temperature, the stronger is that dark line. And that's what any jump cannon uses. Here is a diagram showing spectra that was gotten by any jump cannon. On the left, you can see she arranged it in terms of the hottest stars, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, to the coolest stars. On the right are the names of the stars. So each individual strip you see here is a spectrum of each individual star. And you can see the spectral lines are different in each individual star, indicating their temperature. And from this, uh, she provided modern day astronomers with information has to do with giving the property of the stars besides temperature. Next, Marie Curie. This is the photo that you saw in the beginnings of the slides. Marie Curie, time 18 to 1900s. She lived during that time. She was a physicist and a chemist. She was the wife of Pierre Curie. And what she did is working on a substance called pitch blend. She was able to extract two pure elements from that pitch blend. She named them polonium and radium. Polonium because her maiden name was Slodowska. She was Polish, and polonium means Poland. So she found these two individual new elements. She shared the Nobel Prize in physics, and she won her own Nobel Prize in chemistry. Amazing. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. Here is a depiction of her as she may have appeared in her laboratory to the left. And to the right would be an area showing uh, information about radioactivity, which is the area that she worked with, radioactivity. Before her, it was discovered that radioactivity uh, involves the idea that there are three basic types of radiation that comes out 
of a heavy element like uranium. Uh, and if uranium is in the form of being an isotope, having more or less some more neutrons, making it heavier, it begins to break down. And as it breaks down, it releases these forms of radiation. It has been, been identified as alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha being two protons and two neutrons, which is like a helium nucleus, uh, beta being a high-speed electron, and gamma being energy, gamma radiation. Lower diagram showing you the uh, characteristics of these three different forms of radioactivity, alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha is stopped by paper, beta is stopped by aluminum, and gamma by concrete. So she worked in the area of radioactivity, and she came up with identifying two new elements, and she won the Nobel Prize. Fantastic. Another person who worked in this area of radioactivity was Lisa Meitner. And the years would be, you could see, 18 to 1900s, again. Uh, and she uh, worked with uh, radioactivity. And uh, she came up with the idea of nuclear fission, an important kind of process necessary to produce nuclear energy. Amazing. She uh, discovered the element protactium with Otto Hahn. Here she is in the laboratory on your left. And on your right, this image gives the idea of how nuclear fission works. If you begin with a neutron, you shoot out a, a neutron hitting some kind of fissionable material like uranium, you can split it in two with splitting the atom, atom splitting, fission. When you do that, it releases a tremendous amount of energy, as you can see here, and it gives you two fissionable materials. In the meantime, it releases three neutrons which go on to strike other fissionable material, like some other uranium atoms, and it starts a chain reaction going in fission, producing that nuclear energy. And that was Lisa Meitner discovering nuclear fission. And we have, as we see here, Henrietta Swan Leavitt, and the years would be 18 to 1900 again. She worked with variable stars, stars that fluctuate in brightness. You can say they oscillate or they pulse in brightness over a certain period of time. Some fluctuate over a short period of time. Some fluctuate over a long period of time. And it seems that almost all stars are variable stars. Here's an example uh, of a variable star in images taken over a period of time, starting up with the upper left, moving through the top to the bottom. In the middle, you can see a star varying in brightness over this period of time. This gives an example of a variable star. And uh, the most common kind of variable star is a star was, that was first discovered in the constellation Cepheus, the king. And as a result, it was called a Cepheid type of variable stars. It has a short period of variation, so it's an easy variable star to uh, spot and to keep a record of. Now, what Henrietta did is she looked at variable stars like the Cepheids in these two celestial objects. On the left is the Large Magellanic Cloud. On the right is the Small Magellanic Cloud. Now, originally they were thought to be clouds, and they were recorded by Magellan. That's why they're called the Magellanic Clouds. But then it was discovered that they're not clouds at all, but they're really galaxies, dwarf satellite galaxies that revolve around our Milky Way galaxy. So they're satellite galaxies 
of our Milky Way galaxy. And these are the two that she observed variable stars in, in order to get her information. And what she did is she made a light curve of the Cepheid variables, and uh, she looked at it in terms of their brightness and their duration, or period of fluctuation in terms of their brightness. And she came up with information that had to do with the connection between their period of fluctuation and their brightness. Period luminosity, it's called. A very important kind of finding because it led Edwin Hubble later on to come up with his Hubble laws and information of that nature. Here's the connection between the periodicity and the luminosity or brightness of these variable stars. So this is the kind of graph that she came up with. You can see uh, upper right would be the Cepheids that are plotted and uh, lower left would be another type of variable star called R. R. Lyra plotted on here in terms of as the luminosity increases, the periodicity gets longer. The duration between the brightness gets longer and longer. That's the connection in terms of period and luminosity that Henrietta found information out about. Next would be Alice Ball. You can see between the years of 18 and 1900, she lived at that time, uh, she was a chemist. And uh, in that capacity, she uh, came up with an effective cure for Hansen's disease. Hansen's disease is leprosy. Here you can see on the left is an image of the actual plant that she derived a substance from that was used to cure leprosy. Halmugra is the plant. There's a misspelling here. Uh, it's supposed to be M-O-O, -O, unless it's spelled both ways. On the right is the Halmuga plant again, drawing a diagram of it. And the substance is derived from the seed of the, and I think it might be pronounced Chalmuga as well, plant. Next is Margaret Mead. The years between, uh, not between, actually, it, it's the years 1900 now. We're moving into the 1900s. Uh, and Mead was a, a cultural anthropologist. She uh, came up with information about a group of people who were uh, uh, people who were non-literal in the area of Oceania. Oceania is an area of the world which is comprised of Indonesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, and Australasia. She studied these people to get information about their behavior and their social life. Margaret Mead. And she's known for various kinds of quotes and in this quote here, uh, she says that uh, children must be taught how to think, not what to think. That's Margaret Mead, cultural anthropologist. Next is Rachel Carson in the 1900s. She uh, was environmentalist. She began as a uh, marine biologist and she studied the environment. She worked uh, with the idea of looking at various kinds of pesticides like DDT and its effect upon the environment and upon the organisms that lived in that environment. So she's also, besides being a uh, marine biologist, she can be called a modern-day environmentalist. 
She wrote a book called A Silent Spring about pesticides and their damage of the environment and organisms in the environment. Uh, so she could also be called the founder of modern-day ecology as well as the environment. Look at these billboards. And this shows a picture of someone that you saw in the beginning of the slides. You see uh, billboards on which you have Hedy Lamarr, famous actress that uh, acted with uh, Robert Taylor in the left and with Clark Gable on the right. She made many pictures, but what did she have to do with science? Well, that's between, let's see, the years of 19 into the year 2000. She had to do with coming up with wireless communication. So she introduced the notion and so can be called the pioneer in wireless communication. Introduced concepts in wireless communication that allows us now to develop areas involving our GPS system, Wi-Fi, and also the Bluetooth. Hedy Lamar. Rosalind Franklin, 1900s. She was a an X-ray crystallographer and a chemist. She came up with taking X-ray diffraction images of DNA. RNA and graphite and uh, as a result was instrumental in discovering that the idea of DNA was double-stranded. Now that came about because she took that x-ray image of DNA. Here it is on the left. You can see the image there. This is the image looking down the molecule from top to bottom. Well, Watson and Crick, who figured out the actual symmetry of the DNA molecule and the fact that it was a double helix, was given this photo by Rosalind, and from that they were able to come up with the notion that the DNA molecule was in reality a double helix, not a single helix, as some scientists thought. And so she was instrumental in coming up with the notion that DNA is a double helix. Now we have an astronomer, Vera Rubin. She passed away in 2016. Now, as an astronomer, she worked with rotation curves of galaxies to come up with information that there was some kind of matter that could not be seen in these galaxies. Some galaxies seemed, some, some matter seemed to be missing in these galaxies. But there had to be some matter there. And the reason why she came up with that idea is that the galaxies were not rotating as they should, or the stars in the galaxies are not behaving as stars do in rotating galaxies, as they anticipated they should. Now, here's an image on the left of her working at her workstation. On the right are images on top of a galaxy. It was expected, like you would find in a rotating solar system like ours, that the planets in the solar system on the in the exterior of the solar system would rotate slower than those in the interior portion of it. And that idea was applied to rotating galaxies in terms of stars in the galaxies. The anticipation and expectation was that the stars in the outer portion of the galaxy would rotate slower than those in the inner portion. And so if you look at 
the bottom of that diagram, you can see two curves. One curve is a curve that slopes downward. The upper portion represents stars that would be in the inner portion of the galaxy. The lower portion of the curve represents the stars in the outer. So the expected curve should be the one you see here in curving downward. Stars in the inner portion, faster. Stars in the outer portion of the galaxy, slower. Instead of that, what Vera got was the curve you see in the upper portion, the straight curve. So that meant to her that there was some extra matter there that could not be seen. It wasn't interacting with photons. And so eventually it was called dark matter. And it seems that dark matter makes up most of our universe. So when we look up at the sky, the majority of the universe is not seen. It's made up of dark matter. That was Vera Rubin. Next is Jane Goodall, and uh, she's presently alive. You can see. She, she worked with chimpanzees in Tanzania, and she observed their uh, social life and their family life. So she could be called a primate anthropologist. Here are some photos of her <clears throat> doing her observation of the chimps, two of them. And uh, as a result, she can also be called a primatologist, observing primates in the form of chimpanzees, uh, also a conservationist and a humanitarian. Jane Goodall. Now here is Katherine Johnson. She passed away in 2016. She was instrumental in making it possible for our first American in space, Alan Shepard, to go up in space and come back down again in his Mercury spacecraft. She also made it possible for the Apollo 11 to go to the moon to bring three astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, to the moon. She figured out the trajectory that was necessary for this to be accomplished and to make it successful only with a pen, a slide rule, and her amazing mathematical mind. Fantastic. This would be the kind of a trajectory, the path, that the Apollo 11 and the following Apollo missions to the moon would have to take. And she had to calculate it effectively and successfully in order for this to take place. Amazing accomplishment in our space program. Mathematician and famous for her work. The first woman in space was a Russian. Valentina Tereshkova. Had to be Russian with that name. So here she is, the first cosmonaut woman in space. She went up in the Russian spacecraft, the Vostok 6, in 1963. An accomplishment. Now we have Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Uh, Jocelyn was an astrophysicist working in the area of radio astronomy. And uh, she's still alive, by the way. Uh, she did her work in England. And as an, a, a, a graduate student, she constructed a radio telescope that she used to receive radio signals coming from a certain part of our universe 
coming from the area of the constellation the Fox, Vulcapella. And uh, as a result, it was first interpreted as possible intelligence signals coming from some kind of civilization in space. But later on, it was discovered that it wasn't coming from any intelligence source at all, but was in reality a natural phenomenon coming from a star that rotated about 100 to 700 times a second, which eventually was named the pulsar because it pulsated out this energy in the form of radio and, in some cases, other forms of energy as well. Discovered by Jocelyn Bell Burnell with her radio telescope. Now, here's some images of this type of star, which is, in reality, a neutron star, now called a pulsar. This is not the image of the star that uh, she was looking at, the pulsar she discovered, but it gives you an idea of what a pulsar looks like. And you can see in the upper images, the images of how a pulsar may look. You can see the disk around it with the bipolar jets coming out from its interior, which carries the radio signals. Lower left would be an image showing that it has tremendously strong magnetic fields. And uh, lower right, again, would be uh, a drawing depicting how the pulsar would look with the bipolar jets coming out from its interior. This is the constellation, the fox, in which the pulsar was located. And the fox is located between two very prominent constellations, the Northern Cross or Cygnus the Swan, upper left, and lower left, Aquila the Eagle. And in between, you can see the constellation that she found the pulsar in, Vulpicula. Vulpicula is the correct pronunciation. Next is Margaret Geller. Margaret Geller, astrophysicist. She's still living at the present time. She uh, made a map of the nearby area of the universe. Mapping supercluster of galaxies, using that in her mapping of a close vicinity part of our universe. This is how the map looks. Each dot on this map is a supercluster of galaxies. And you can see in this map that there are voids in the center of a kind of bubble arrangement of the superclusters. So the superclusters form a kind of surface of a bubble, and the interior is a void. And in the upper part, you can see a kind of a wall of superclusters, one next to the other. Superclusters in the upper portion of the universe and in the southern portion of the universe. So the first to map portions of the universe using superclusters of galaxies. Margaret Geller. Sally Ride, the first American woman in space. She passed away in 2012. She uh, went up in the Challenger space shuttle and uh, she was prominent in promoting women getting into areas of science and technology. Sally Ride, first woman, American woman in space. Here we have May Carol Jemison, the first black person in space. In this case, the the first black woman in space. She went up on the space shuttle Endeavour. Uh, she herself 
is a medical practitioner, teacher, chemical engineer, and was a volunteer in the Peace Corps. She uh, now is promoting the idea of women getting into areas of science and technology and also the notion of making sure that uh, any form of discrimination is not present in any of these fields. Next is, uh, you can see here, Karen Uhlenbeck. She had been teaching at Princeton, and when she was teaching there, she's still alive, by the way, as she was teaching there, she came up with various kinds of mathematics that helped astronomers to do different things in terms of figuring out various kinds of information in astronomy and in other fields as well. She was the first woman to win the Abel Prize, which is given in Oslo, Norway. The prize for mathematics. So, of course, she was a mathematician. There are some workings that she had gone through, you've seen on the board behind her. So, major mathematician. First woman to receive the Abel Prize in mathematics. That was given to her because of her work in analysis geometry, in partial differential equations, in the string theory, and in the gauge theory. Amazing kind of work, enabling other scientists to carry on their work in areas of science, different areas of science. By the way, with the uh, Abel Prize, she also received, I have to mention, she also received a prize, $700,000 prize. Now, these are images showing on the left the M87 galaxy with a jet shooting out on the left-hand side of it coming from its center. Because in the center is a black hole. And the first image of a black hole taken in M87 or any place at all in the universe was possible because of the work being done by some woman who came up with the algorithm making it possible. By the way, here is an amazing first photo image of a black hole showing a ring of light around it on the right-hand side of material falling into the black hole, like water going down the drain. Here she is. Her name, Katie Bauman. She's still around, of course, and you can see her on the left and the right. She's the one that came up with that algorithm. And with that algorithm, she allowed astronomers to be able to connect eight different radio telescopes throughout the world in order to make one big telescope to take that image. These are the telescopes here, eight different telescopes in various parts of the world, all connected together by computerization using the algorithm that was necessary that uh, was formulated by Katie. Amazing work. By the way, uh, the telescope which involved connecting these eight radio telescopes was called the Event Horizon Telescope. The EHT Telescope. And it continues on where more telescopes are being connected to enable the Event Horizon Telescope to be able to take images of various kinds of black holes further out in our universe. Amazing work. So we should keep all this in mind as we saw some representation of women 
in science. Now, those are only a sample of some women in science. But keep in mind that uh, let's get more women involved in science, technology, and mathematics. Let's encourage the use of the brain power in women in order to have them contribute to these areas. Women in science. Thank you for watching this presentation. And I'd like to mention that uh, I also have a podcast that you might want to access called Carl's Orbit. Thank you again for watching this presentation. And remember to encourage women in science.